Hello. Um, as part of a, I'm not going to say New Year's resolution because I hate New Year's resolutions, but I'm trying to be braver with writing stuff and putting it out there into the world. So um, I thought I would present something that I've been working on, just a small thing. I hope you enjoy. It's called Misfit. Patrick had disappeared with a tall stranger. Not a textbook stud, to be honest, rather slim for my very inexperienced palette, but extremely handsome all the same. I couldn't see them anywhere, but they were either invasively facially locked to one another or they were already in a taxi back to the stranger's place. To a bed in London, the Holy Grail. And so I stood alone. The only drink that I enjoyed on nights like this was a double shot of arches and lemonade, which was served in a dangerously delicate plastic cup. It was viciously sweet, painfully so. The flavour latches to the back of your cheeks for hours and a combination of the sugar hit and the alcohol content makes sure that you can't fall asleep. Which is always where I'd rather have been. But to be there would be to be alone. And as tiring as this was, that option was infinitely more exhausting. I wanted touch and warmth and comfort more so than ever before. This had all been sold to me as an essential rite of passage. And the truth is, I'd always maintained some inexplicable level of masochistic fascination. The air in the room was thick with heat. The remaining dance floor rovers with much more staying power than I, those dedicated to squeezing time, desperate for a final score. Well, they were slick with hot sweat. I was also slick, but mine was ice cold. And potently mixed now with Garnier Wet Look Extra Firm Hold Gel, which had lived a full transformative life starting as liquid via pyrex rigidity in my unflatteringly twisted spiked hair before returning to chemical water dribbling down my forehead past my eyes my nose and onto my lips i could taste bitter science and my eyes stung to a level that i could only keep them open fractionally Every item of clothing that I owned at this time in my life was synthetic. And as an obese young go-getter with neither fashion sense or any degree of internal confidence, um, external confidence I had in abundance, I had decided that a night in a gay club was best attended in thick, ill-fitting denim jeans. I had at this stage been trying to practice listening to myself. Listening to my body would provide all the instruction needed to be healthy and successful and confident. The self-help book that I've been reading had screamed this information at me. My body told me that I needed a drink. Water, probably. But booze was cheaper. The taxi from Guildford had come in at £45. Even four ways, a sizeable chunk of my evening budget had already been swallowed up. Patrick had handed over his contribution breezily. To that point, I hadn't quite got my head around the varying degrees of wealth in students. More generous parents, probably, I would always assume. But more likely that my diving headfirst into a gluten-free lifestyle with the £30 per week spelt base cake, biscuit, pasta, bill and all had pushed my food bill higher than that of my student friends higher than the extremely generous weekly contributions from my parents could stretch to. It's hard when no one understands. They didn't have to worry about bloating. I did. I had conical breasts. My conical breasts and I stood in what I assumed was a loose bar queue. I had an immediate crush on the bar and barman. This is nothing new. It's an intoxicating alchemy that springs from the heady mix of effusive confidence exuded by someone working behind a bar. The cocktail of power shaken with enough testosterone to charge a Grecian epic. With a twist perhaps of jealousy at the degree of safety and removal proffered by the bar itself. 
I force myself forward through a throng of shoaling males, mostly a slender bunch, but collectively in the sheer volume of their throng, it surprises me how fully formed and dense a barrier they can manifest. I closely brush past one. Actually, I can't say brush. For me, brush implies dryness. I intimately sloshed past one who, on feeling the harsh polyester pocket of my plaid effect shirt against his nipple, swung around with alarm. Harshly bleached highlights and entirely without facial hair, intricately gardened eyebrows and a large forehead that glistened with pouring sweat. The time spent pruning the appearance he presented was fully undermined by two rows of yellowing teeth, m mostly fully formed. A couple of snags and chips brought together in delicious harmony by a thin metallic cable brace. Not being a dentist, I can't diagnose with certainty, but I had no doubt that the black currant lollipop clamped between his incisors was definitely a contributing factor. Party boys, Patrick had highlighted earlier in the evening, often use this as a way for baiting for potential snocks. It was around 2.30am. Speedy calculations suggested that this was probably chupper chup 25 or so. He smiled, a toothy smile. Jack Daniels. The head of the lolly was small, an old one, perhaps, or maybe just worn down by teamwork. Party boy edged towards me. As much as there was space to do so, bar cues were always where I was most aware of my circumference. The population of my square metre of floor taken up predominantly by me and my emotional baggage. Party boy closer now, his seeping sweat permeating even the plasticky fabric that enrobed me. Predominantly dating via app and the self-preservation that needs to occur as a result has led to the formation of a rigorous process to filter out both potential embarrassment for myself and for the message -y. Step one, a series of banal fact-finding niceties answered with pleasantries, whether they're true or not. Step two, I await into a one-word question that acts as the gateway to the inevitable sexual onslaught. Number three, my patented chubby disclaimer. I've learned from experience that saying chubby rather than fat tends to be a useful term to elicit a kinder response. Uh, the disclaimer acts as a warning, a get-out clause to allow the unwitting victim on the other end of the conversation a means of escape. The disclaimer is laced with a heavy dose of deprecation and is highly apologetic. Naturally, I then apologise for being apologetic. Step four. The semi-clothed and nude photos are traded. As ever, I am asked to go first. This is presumably for reconnaissance purposes on their part. I understand fully. I send a picture of my tummy with no head. One final opportunity for him to escape in case the preceding chances were missed. Step five, only then can I trepidatiously begin to let down my guard to an acceptable extent. Now this preparation, this laying down of groundwork, does not translate to real life spur of the moment dalliances. My eyes flicker in apprehension, which Party Boy must have seen because he stops and takes a moment to step back again as much as possible in the circumstances. He scans the canvas before him rapidly. I assume the criteria must be limited as he frowns slightly, laughs rudely and says quickly, It's all right. I don't mind. I'm not picky. The rapier of lolly stick nearly chips my teeth with the brutal force with which it is thrust into my mouth. It occurs to me slightly that I haven't played a part in the instigating decision process, but it's overwhelmingly pleasant to feel wanted. 
Jack Daniels has always burnt my mouth a little and Diet Cokes tends to give my teeth a fairy feeling, so I tend to avoid it. Gently infused with the anaesthetical laboratory now gushing from my melting scalp, this kiss tasted like cyanide. With retrospect, and thankfully many alternatives since, I can now recognise the technical flaws, but this was my first. A benchmark. This wonderful party boy, oh noble man, oh most generous spirit. This was a benchmark set with such limitless potential for future betterment that I can now see it for what it was, a gift. As his tongue tip diligently hiked the hills and vales of my gum line, I instructed my own to thrust cover my few amalgam fillings. In doing so, his indelicately unfiled orthodontic scaffolding snagged and ripped a small slash just off from the blade of my tongue. Pulling back, I clamped. The black current rock shattered beneath my teeth, without which I'm not sure how much of my tongue would still be usable. As it was, the brakes set on by the splintering boil sweep prevented my already battle-marked tongue from full incision. Rather a heavy hammering for my molars started it throbbing uncontrollably. Party Boy, now retracted, looks at me with a frankly self-indulgent level of disgust. I look him deep in the eye and he into mine. And I was crying. Not emotional crying. Uh, the swelling behind my teeth was now pulsing hard. I watched as the sodden cardboard stick that hung suspended on his lower lip began to peel away and drop to the floor. His gaze fixed deep into my soul. He stepped backwards and with a cock of his eyebrow he shook his head. Then in a wisp of purple glitter, he turned and shimmied across the dance floor like a thin genie. I presumed to seek out his chuppa chuck diva. It's 4am. Pneumatically quaking with wintry frigidity, I lay beneath the escalators outside Costa in Waterloo Station, waiting for the 5.35 to Portsmouth Harbour. A chilly, draughty gust wafted through the torn hole in the crotch of my jeans, worn thin from dancing with a chunky thigh. Never mind. A chubby young adult learns to sew adeptly through necessity. It was now officially December 16th. In just three days, I'd be back on a train, heading to sit by the fire with my family for Christmas in Cambridge. Cambridge, which had felt so small when I'd lived there, yet now I look forward to any opportunity to return and explore. Maybe it was being a misfit, all this running, flickering, flitting between groups of people who'd already found their definition. I was running to find mine too. Lying on the floor, wrapped in my coat, and on my own. I was still running to find mine. At least Burger King opens at five. <laughs>